Welcome back to the listener's commentary on Paul's letter to the Romans. In this session, we will be looking at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. But before we jump into the text itself, let's make sure we have the context in mind before us. Romans chapter 6 flows directly out of the end of Romans chapter 5. If you recall from our last session, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through the end of the chapter, really contrast what Adam achieved with what Jesus achieved, showing how Jesus solves the problem of sin, death, and condemnation that was unleashed in this world through Adam and that we all have participated in. And so that's where chapter 5 ends in general. It's dominated by two kingdoms, one kingdom marked by sin and death, another kingdom marked by grace and life. Adam unleashed the kingdom of sin and death. Jesus ushered in the kingdom of grace and life. And in doing so, he has accomplished and undone Adam's work much more than we could have ever anticipated. And so that idea of much more is really important there at the end of chapter 5. Now, chapter 6 picks up at that point. And really, beginning in chapter 6 all the way through chapter 7, Paul is going to then detail how the work of Jesus has uh, overcome the ideas of sin and death and done so far beyond what we could have expected. He has done it in a way that the Old Testament law never did. And so Jesus now is the solution to the problems of Adam, namely sin and death. So notice how chapter 6, verse 1 plays off of the last sentence of chapter 5. Let me read you the last two verses of chapter 5, the first verse of chapter 6. It reads like this. Uh, Chapter 5, verse 20 says, The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, Grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. And so do you hear the connection there, how at the end of chapter 5, where sin increased, grace abounded. Grace increased all the more. So Paul picks up in chapter 6 with then a rhetorical question saying, Well, if sin made grace increase, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace can keep on increasing? And then the initial answer is, may it never be. And so chapter 6 flows directly out of the end of chapter 5, playing off of that. In the first part of chapter 6, he deals generally with our identity and our relationship with sin in general. And then, beginning in the middle of chapter 6, he introduces the idea of the law and how grace does what the law could not. And that idea of the law will be carried all the way through chapter 7 until then Paul comes to chapter 8 with the grand climactic conclusion to Jesus' great work and thus the security we have in him because of what he's done. One really important note about the structure of this section, beginning here in 6.1 and all the way through chapter 7, is that the argument is carried forward by a series of rhetorical questions. And so you have to pay attention to the questions so that you really understand the point he's making in each section. Uh, ignoring the questions has led to some confusion for uh, Bible readers, particularly in chapter 7. So pay attention to the rhetorical question. That sets up the the uh, meaning of the paragraph that he's given. All right. Now, in chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, our specific section in this recording, uh, that section is all about our identity, who we are. It's really important as you read chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, that you recognize there aren't commands. There aren't imperatives. There are indicatives. In other words, we're giving statements of fact that tell us who we are. They don't command us to do anything. In fact, we don't even get our first command until verse 11, and then that sets up the command section that shows up in verses 12 through 14. So this section is about who you are. It's about our identity in Christ, and our behavior flows out of our identity. So that's really important here. So pay attention to to this as descriptions of who we are. In essence, what Paul says here is, if we are in Christ, 
then we are in the kingdom of grace and life that was described at the end of chapter 5, not in the kingdom of sin and death. And in order to make that point, Paul uses the imagery of death, burial, and resurrection in connection with Christian baptism. Now, baptism isn't the primary point here, but because of the way Paul uses baptism here and just assumes that his original audience has all been baptized, even though he's never been there, it really brings up some important teaching about the nature of Christian baptism. So we'll have a special study on Christian baptism itself, and so you can look for that down below so we can understand what Paul is saying about baptism here in Romans 6 and how that connects with what's said about baptism elsewhere in the New Testament. So don't lose, though, the point that this is primarily about our identity, and baptism thus heralds or proclaims a new identity. So the dominant question being answered in chapter 6, 1 through 11 is, why shouldn't you continue to sin, especially since sin made grace abound? Why shouldn't you continue to sin? And the basic answer Paul gives is this. We shouldn't continue to sin because we died to sin and were alive to God. That's the big idea of this section. Okay, with that, let's jump into the details of the text. Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 states the question and gives the initial answer. It reads like this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So you get the the question that he's dealing with and the initial answer. And the question is, shall we continue in sin? And the answer is, may it never be. In Greek, meganoitats, really a strong, emphatic, no way, no way. And why not? Well, the reason is, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? And so the reason we shouldn't continue in sin is because we have died to sin. Notice, again, the tense of the verb, not we should die to sin. This is a statement of fact. We did die to sin. We have died to sin. So how shall we who already died to sin still live in it? To die to something means to end the relationship with. It's over, right? The relationship is severed. So physical death is the ending of the relationship between the spirit and the body in a certain sort of way. Uh, and that relationship is over, and hence you get a dead body, right? To die to something means the relationship with it is severed. It's over. And thus, we are people who have died to sin. That's our new identity. This is who we are. Our relationship to sin is is dead. It's over. It's severed. That's the point. Now, Paul goes on to explain then more fully uh, about this idea of dying to sin in the following verses. So verse 3 says, or don't you know, and he assumes that they know this. He's really expecting a positive answer. So, or don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too should walk in newness of life. And so this is where he brings up Christian baptism. And remember, Paul has never been to Rome. He's writing to, to a group of Christians that he doesn't personally know in the sense of having been there, but he assumes that they've all been baptized. Why can he do that? Well, because that was the Christian experience in the first century. Jesus said, go and make disciples. How do you do that, Jesus? Well, you do that by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And so baptism was central to disciple making in the first century world. Read the book of Acts and you'll see that's what happened as they made disciples. They baptized them usually on the same day in the book of Acts, usually right away. More about that in the special study on baptism, so check that out. But here, the primary thing is, the point he's making is that baptism declares a new identity, a new status for us. We are somebody different than we were prior to our baptism. That's the idea. Um, he says this change, this death to sin, 
occurred in connection with moving into Christ. And baptism displays and de declares this movement in, in a very clear, powerful, tangible way. That's the point. And so he says, we've changed locations. We've changed locations. We have moved from the kingdom of Adam, sin and death, to the kingdom of Christ, grace and life. That's the point. And so don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, notice that, this baptism is into Christ. We've moved into Jesus and out of Adam, all right? And we have been baptized into his death. And so in being baptized, we associated with, we entered into the very death of Jesus. Therefore, verse 4, we have been buried with him. So when we're baptized, it's like being buried. That's the symbolism of immersion in water, which the word baptizo in Greek, baptize, simply means to dip or to immerse. And so Christians from the very beginning have been immersed or dipped or plunged down into water. And so it's like this idea of being buried. So you were buried with him under the water in baptism, uh, into death. So you've entered into this death so that for the purpose that, that's the idea of that so that, for the purpose that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too should walk in newness of life. One way to think about what he's saying there is that uh, we've experienced phase one of our resurrection, not the resurrection of the body. That's still to come at the final day when Jesus returns. We'll get the resurrection of our body, but we've experienced the initial phase of our resurrection, phase one. That means the, the resurrection to new life, and we, we can now walk. Walk has to do with going about our life in newness of life. We have a new life, a new kind of life that's like Jesus' resurrection life at work in us so that we can live a different kind of life because we're a different kind of person. Paul goes on then in verses 5 and 6 um, and explains this more fully and completely. How did that work? And this is what he says. For, notice verse 5 begins with four. He's explaining. So four is that logical connective that says, let me explain this further. For, if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, which he just described, right? When we are baptized, we were united with him in his death. So if we've become united with him in the likeness of his death, and we have, because our baptism declared that, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And so now we're going to experience that resurrection life, resurrection power, new life now coursing through our veins. Again, this is common teaching in Paul's New Testament letters. If you've listened to the listener's commentary on the book of Ephesians, you hear the same thing in Ephesians chapter 2, how we were raised up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places. And so when we become a Christian, it's not just that we get our sins forgiven, we're also given a new life, resurrection life. And so we're not just forgiven sinners, we're new creations. We're new human beings with new life resurrected out of our death in sin to new life in Christ. We've moved kingdoms, right? Like at the end of chapter 5, Paul was talking about two kingdoms, one that's in Adam, one that's in Christ, one that's marked by sin and death, one that's marked by grace and life. We've entered into this new kingdom where we have new power. So certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection Verse 6 then says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And so this death and resurrection we experience and that our baptism embodied and displayed and declared, um, this death and resurrection has as its ultimate goal setting us free from the power of sin, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Paul begins verse 6 with a participle, knowing this, knowing this. Well, what's the relationship between what he said in the first half of the sentence in verse 5 and verse 6? Well, knowing this means because we know something, right? Like this is something we know. And again, Paul just assumes that his original Christian audience knows this because this was part of sharing the gospel in the ancient world. When the apostles went about and 
told people about Jesus and helped them understand what it meant to become a follower of Jesus, this is something they taught them, and thus they knew this. But it's not always something we teach today, and thus we don't always know this. So we need to pay really close attention to verse 6, because this is something we need to know about what it meant to become a Christian so we can live the Christian life more fully. So he says in verse 6, knowing this, here's what we know, that our old self was crucified with him. What's our old self? Well, that's our in Adam identity, right? It's literally old man. The old man was put to death, was crucified. That's our in Adam us, our own personal BC in our own personal before Christ, we had a different status, a different identity that was in Adam. But now we've moved into Christ. So our old self is our in Adam self. And notice that old self was crucified with him. Again, we're talking statements of fact, right? Like we said in the introduction, indicatives, not imperatives. So this doesn't say that our old self should be crucified as if we're supposed to, to crucify our old self. It says it was crucified. Pay attention to the tense there, right? It was crucified. Our baptism, again, embodied this, declared this, displayed this. We entered into his death so that our old identity, our the in Adam us, was crucified with Christ. It, it died with Christ. Died with him. Why? What was the goal of that? Well, keep reading verse 6. In order that our body of sin might be done away with. What's our body of sin? Well, a number of commentators take this phrase to refer to the whole person, the just you, right? Like whatever makes you, you, our body of sin refers to the whole person. To me, this seems a little bit redundant, particularly with the preceding, the old man. That's the whole person. That's our whole identity. Our old man was crucified. And so it seems like body of sin, if taken to refer to just our old identity, our old person, that would be redundant in view of what uh, he just said. Uh, The goal of taking it as uh, our, just really our whole self, is to avoid any hint of dualism. Dualism has this idea that spirit is good, body is bad, and thus we don't want to even hint towards dualism because the Bible never suggests the body is bad, right? Like when God created human beings in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1 with a body. He said, this is very good, right? Uh, Not only that, mankind, humans are going to have a body forever because we're going to be resurrected and we'll have a body and live on the new earth forever. So the body isn't bad, matter isn't bad, and the spirit's not good, right? So there's not dualism. So it's right to want to avoid dualism. And yet, I don't think we should therefore take this phrase body of sin and eliminate any kind of allusion to the physical body from it. And the reason I say that is because if you read everything Paul says in chapter 6 and on into chapter 7, Paul has this sense that somehow sin gets into our body. And we may not fully understand that, and it's not because our body is inherently bad, but it is because our body has been in some way corrupted by sin and thus death. And so Our body isn't bad, essentially and inherently. It's good, and we'll get a new body that's perfected and restored someday in the resurrection. Uh, But uh, our body right now has been affected by sin. And so Paul says immediately after the paragraph we're looking at in this recording, in verses 12 through following, that we, we must no longer present the parts of our body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but instead we need to present the parts of our body to God. Um, And so this is bodily activity. The same thing happens in chapter 7 where Paul um, says this, For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the parts of our body to bear fruit for death. This is consistent all throughout chapter 7 where Paul constantly comes back to this idea of our body and how our body has been co-opted by sin and thus led to death. And so somehow sin gets into our body and it makes us its prisoner, right? So sin has corrupted our body. So we should understand the body of sin here in Romans 6, 6 as the body insofar as it has been corrupted by sin, 
Uh, And what Paul means by that is that certain tendencies get embedded in our bodies, and we are now no longer dominated by that. That's what he's saying. So our old self was crucified with Christ in order that this physical body that has been corrupted by sin might be done away with. Let me be really clear. When That's a, just not a great translation, because when we hear might be done away with, that sounds like might be gotten rid of because the body's so bad. That's not what Paul means. The, the word translated might be done away with is the idea of voided out, nullified. Paul's used this word in chapter four and chapter three already. The idea is that our body of sin might be sucked of its power. Think of a check that is now voided out. It doesn't have any buying power, purchasing power, right? If it has void written across it. That's the idea here is that our body of sin is now null and void. It doesn't rule the day anymore. And that's why Paul says, so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And so in coming into Christ, we have received a new identity that not only freed us from the penalty of sin, justification by forgiving us, it also frees us from the power of sin by liberating us from the dominating effects of sin in our life so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So our old identity was crucified with Christ. The result of that was that this body that was corrupted by sin should no longer rule the day, is no longer in charge. And the ultimate result of that, or the ultimate goal of that, is that we should no longer live as slaves to sin. And verse 7 just summarizes very simply, for he who has died is freed from sin, right? And we died with Christ. And so he who has died is freed from sin. And so that's our new identity. That's who we are. Paul continues in verses 8 through 10 with this death and resurrection uh, analogy and imagery that is embodied in our baptism and that declares our new identity by saying this, verse 8, Now, if we've died with Christ, and we have, he's already explained that, so this is if we've died with Christ and we have, we believe that we shall also live with him. So there's a resurrection that follows this death, knowing, here's something we know again, knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death is no longer master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And remember, we've identified with his death. We've entered into his death. And so what's true about him is now true about us. And so just as he died to sin, so we died to sin. Just as he lives to God, so We're alive to God. And so now we have this brand new identity, this brand new uh, kind of life where we're dead to sin, but alive to God. And so verse 11 then tells us, so we need to think about ourselves this, this way. So we get our very first command in verse 11. What are you supposed to do with all this information that we just covered in chapter 6, verses 1 through 10? What are you supposed to do with it? Well, the first thing you're supposed to do with it is think about yourself this way. Verse 11 says, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so as you read through verses uh, chapter 6, 1 through 10, your response should be, this is who I am. I need to think about myself this way. But what if I don't feel this way? What if I don't feel very dead to sin? Well, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So we need to start thinking about ourselves this way so that we begin to live this way, right? And so that's our first response to this is we've got to know who we are in Christ, and then we've got to think about ourselves this way. Even so, consider, and that word consider is do the math calculate, reckon yourself, right? Like calculate this is true about yourself. By faith, based on what Paul has just said about you, count yourself this way. I am dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is what God has done for us in Christ. And so we need to think about ourselves this way. Now, what are some implications of this before we leave this section? What are some implications of Romans chapter 6, 1 through 11. Well, one implication is this. For those of us who are in Christ, sin's no longer in charge. Sin no longer reigns. This doesn't mean that 
If you're a Christian, you're immune to temptation. In fact, Paul is going to go on in verses 12 through 14 and talk about how we rearrange our life based on this in order to avoid temptation. So we're not immune to temptation. It does mean, however, that sin is no longer in charge and that as a believer in Jesus, you no longer have to follow sin's orders in your life. The point, as Ben Witherington says, is simply this. Once one is a new creature in Christ, one is no longer in bondage to sin. Sin no longer makes Christians an offer they can't refuse. And so we are free from the power of sin. We have a brand new identity that is no longer controlled or dominated by the passions of our old identity, our old life. And thus, Paul says, we're freed from sin. Notice that, freed. Again, past tense, Christians don't have to sin anymore. Now, be very careful with that statement, because that doesn't mean we can necessarily be perfect. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying we're not in bondage. We're not slaves of sin anymore. Paul will carry out that slave imagery in more detail in the second half of chapter 6. And so there's a new control center in our life. That is now Christ and the Spirit that gives us new ability, and new power to live a new kind of life. That's the point. And so we, remember the dominant question is, why shouldn't we continue in sin anymore? Because that's not who we are anymore. Sin doesn't reign over us or rule over us anymore. That's just not who we are. We've died to sin, and we're alive to God, and thus we're capable of living a new kind of life. It's not just that we should live a new kind of life. We actually can. That's the whole point of this section is we don't sin anymore because we recognize how toxic and awful it is, and we've been given new identity and new power so that we can actually live a brand new kind of life. Now, how do we do that? Paul takes that up in chapter 6, verses 12 through 14.